Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So today we'll start on the textbook, chapter one, and we will sort of go through it chapter by chapter. So um, starts the, by saying that there are multiple schools of thought and uh, <coughs> starts by describing that at the end of the chapter what do we hope to achieve so basically um, the learning goals are that there are two broad schools of thought this is an oversimplification actually there are huge numbers of schools of thought but it's a good idea to just start by orthodox versus heterodox but within each school there are a lot of variations so I guess the even bigger point is that uh, economics is a contested discipline it is not that there is one truth and we know it and we are going to teach it to you like if you are teaching how to repair a car or how to build a house then more or less there is a one known accepted procedure but in economics uh, almost every theory is hotly contested so that's one thing that this is a debate that we are turning to learn so in the debate it's important to know what side A thinks and what side B thinks and not and for the student it's useful not to make any judgments just try to understand don't try to come to a conclusion about who is right and who is wrong you should hold that judgment and just try to understand what is being said uh, macro is about aggregates macroeconomics so it deals with the big picture not individuals and the third point is that the methodology of social science is very different from that of the physical sciences we can't really apply uh, equations and formulas and laws because human beings are not subject to deterministic so what are the essential components of economics well, economics starts by the study of human behavior but human behavior occurs within a social context you are part of your society you are part of a community and that has a large impact on what you do and also it occurs within a historical context so today the way we think is very different from the way people thought 100 years ago so the set of behaviors that I can expect from students in, sitting in this class is very very different from if I was teaching the same class in the University of Pennsylvania the students would have entirely different ideas about what is suitable behavior and how should we act and how should we interact so social context is very important economics necessarily interacts with politics cultures and other social institutions because of this factor we cannot take economics in isolation so one of the schools of thought that is normally taught in 90% of the schools, even more, um, is neoclassical economics. According to this theory, human behavior is rational, people maximize pleasure, people avoid pain, and um, all transactions are market transactions. So. Uh, and these transactions occur at the market clearing price so the idea that there may be multiple prices is not allowed in the theory so the market clearing price is one at which demand equals supply and <clears throat> when this happens then that is an equilibrium and the price actually conveys information about the social values if there is a large demand for something that means that it is valuable if the something is in little demand then it's not too valuable 
and the market, uh, the free market leads to a good outcome, uh, as if by an invisible hand principle. So it means that the government should not interfere with the markets. And markets allocations are fair, you get what you deserve, the laborer gets the marginal product of labor, the capitalist gets the marginal product of capital, everyone gets what he deserves. So <coughs> these are some of the basic ideas of neoclassical economics. So in this view of the world, the government should not, should, should, uh, I mean, there's the famous aphorism that the government which governs least is the best. But there is some role that if somebody is really desperate and down and out, and then you should provide some social services. But at the same time, when you provide social services, uh, the neoclassical economist is very concerned about the possibility that if we give people money, then they will stop working. So the disincentive to work is there. Uh, so with this kind of mindset, which became dominant in the USA, the neoclassical policies, with the coming of Reagan Thatcher in the 1970s, uh, the idea was to downsize the government, reduce government budget cuts, budget balancing, eliminate social welfare program. So one of the biggest ones which was cut down was AFDC aid to families with dependent children. This basically helped uh, women who were not supported by husbands for various reasons, divorce or death, and they had to bring up children. So these people were in a very desperate bind because the woman can either take care of the child or she can do the job. So the AFDC was designed to help them, but it was reduced and uh, removed uh, with the very disastrous results because basically they found out after later um, studies that if the woman goes to work, the child is left alone, then he will remember turn into a criminal or a drug addict or something else, and that's what happened. And so the cost that you pay eventually is much larger than supporting the families. But anyway, this is what the neoclassical theory, uh, which was implemented by Reagan and Thatcher, uh, suggests. One of the things that the uh, book says is that the, what is orthodox and what is heterodox also changes. And in fact, prior to the coming of the Reagan-Thatcher revolution, the Keynesian theories were dominant and the Chicago school was considered to be unorthodox. -er. So this has also changed since the 1970s. So again, according to the neoclassical theory, Economics, what is economics? Economics is the science of scarcity. There is unlimited wants, but there are limited goods. Everyone wants to fulfill all their desires. And that's why it's, uh, scarcity cannot be removed because there's just too many wants and too few goods. And so there are trade-offs. If you give some, something to somebody, then the other person cannot have it. You cannot have more of everything. However, uh, we note that this is true only if you have full employment. If, if there's resources that are lying idle, then you can create more and everybody can have more. And uh, in fact, one of the most uh, important resources, which is labor, is frequently left underutilized in capitalist systems. So as opposed to this vision of economics, we have heterodox economics. In heterodox economics, um, the authors of the book identify three schools of thought, Marxist, institutionalist, and Keynesian. All of these people think of themselves as very different from each other, but all of them are common in the sense that they all reject uh, neoclassical very strongly. So basically, the Marxist theory was based on the idea that People who have capital have all the power and all the money and <coughs> they use the capital to exploit the laborers. 
And so the solution that was proposed was that the government should own all the capital and there should be no capitalists and the production processes should be organized by the government. The institutional school of thought says that the economy runs by the means of institutions. So there's the banking sector and the insurance sector and the many other institutions and these have to be taken into account. These are constantly evolving and so basically you have to study economics within the context of history and within the construct of institutions. You can't uh, do what the neoclassicals do which is to uh, think in terms of abstractions without any historical uh, context. And Keynesian is the least heterodox of all. The only thing it says is that uh, it accepts nearly all neoclassical assumptions, but it says that the labor market, you don't have supply and demand equilibrium, so the government should uh, make sure that the full employment holds. So some of the key elements of the heterodox approach is that there is no standard pattern of human behavior. Human behavior is uh, governed by um, social context. And rationality does not require selfishness. In fact, selfishness is highly irrational in most uh, societies because we all need cooperation to get anything done. And in a society where people say that uh, selfish behavior is bad, which is common in traditional societies like ours, but not so in American society today. In fact, when I was going to university in 1971, we had a course on contemporary moral issues and there was an article by Ayn Rand which said that selfishness is a virtue. And at that time, I was the class in the... And she, she wrote that why selfishness is a good thing, even though everybody thinks of it as bad. At that time, in 1970s, we had a discussion in the classroom, and most of the students thought that this was wrong. And there were a few people who thought that this was correct. But today, if this discussion was to take place, then uh, now everybody accepts that selfishness is yani the how people behave. So it's not a question of whether it's wrong or right. This is just natural. So uh, that's uh, now if in a society where selfishness carries a stigma and where people think of it as bad, then it is very bad to behave selfishly because then you will not get the cooperation that you need from others in your own time of need. Um, another uh, issue that Neoclassical says that people maximize, but basically maximization is impossible because you know, when we are looking at decisions, I want to choose option A or choose option B, then I have to make a forecast that what will happen if I choose option A. But what will happen is uncertain because uh, the consequence of my actions does not depend solely on me. It depends on the decisions that everybody else is making and also on random factors. So nobody can say what will maximize and what will not maximize. And so basically the set of options that are available to me, the choices, that depends on a large variety of things including you know, your class and status and um, position in society. The choices that I will make have nothing to do with optimization, but how I do them depend on, uh, depends on a lot of factors which are complicated. So prices and wages are not determined by supply and demand. The prices are typically set by firms with market power. Firms which don't have market power try to acquire that power and everyone has some amount of market power 
for example, even our grocery store at the local market, they charge a higher price than the sabzi mandi because they have some amount of market power and somebody who comes to. So they set prices, uh, the wages that are paid to the laborers, again this doesn't have to do with market clearance, it has to do with the political struggle between the capitalists and the laborers. The standard supply and demand policy conclusions don't hold. If you cut wages, this will not increase the supply. And if you increase wages, this will not lead to unemployment. All of the standard policy conclusions that students are taught are wrong. So what is the definition of economics? Well, basically, it is how a society decides what we should create in terms of production and how we should distribute it. <coughs> and so there is no question of scarcity. Wants are socially created. If we decide that we should live a simple life and, and, and the society encourages this kind of lifestyle, then everybody will live a, a simple lifestyle and we will not we will uh, um, do, we will not see such waste and extravagance and luxury if people don't approve of this. <clears throat> so there may be no scarcity. There may be that everybody has enough to eat and drink, and um, basic needs are satisfied, and nobody wants any more. That's actually the standard Islamic paradigm. The resources that we have to fulfill these are also socially created. We decide whether we want to cut wood, cut trees for wood, or whether we want to farm. The most important resource is the human resource. The people are the ones who create everything. Now the supply siders start with the assumption that the labor and all the resources are always fully employed. This is an absurd assumption. We just goes against what we see every day. So in the heterodox theory, the most important problem is that how can we achieve full employment? Not of all resources, because resources are we going to create, but of human beings, because that is the most important resource. And if we have humans are unemployed, this leads to a large numbers of problems, one of which is that you're not producing at the capacity, so you don't have efficiency in production. So what about the role of government? Unlike the neoclassical, which says the government just shouldn't be there, the government provides the basic ground rules and structure for the entire economy. Without the government, the economy cannot function. So to think of an economy without government is not sensible. It provides the rules of the game, it creates jobs, it uh, uh, creates uh, the purpose for the society, it uh, directs the creation and the allocation of resources. Many of the jobs that the government does cannot be left to the private sector. Uh, of course, everybody knows about public goods uh, and uh, defense and many other. Uh, there are many um, examples in uh, Contemporary, For example, the Korean economists decided that we should get into the semiconductor industry. And there was nothing, no comparative design, nobody knew anything about semiconductor. But they knew that the computer technology is going to be dominant in the world to come. And they said, they said let's get into it. So then they started from scratch. It was a mega project. It had billions of dollars of investment which nobody in the private sector could have done. And the government started and from zero and now they have uh, a great semiconductor industry going. So there are many things which only the government can do. In addition, there are some things which only the government should do, like uh, providing water and electricity and basic telephone services. Uh, so in some say, places they have been privatized and this has caused massive damage because 
when people's lives depend on some good and then the uh, private sector has the incentive to overcharge for it and uh, they do, they make profits out, out of the misery of people. So even if the government is inefficient, it is better to leave these things in their hands. By the way, this is also a myth. In general, the efficiency levels in private sector and public sector are quite comparable because it's the same people who run both people, both places. Human behavior is governed by social norms and is changeable. Decisions, uh, this is very important. How we decide basically uh, whether I should do X or Y, whether I should have a high deficit or whether you should have a low deficit, how much taxes should I gather, how much money should I print, all of these things. Well, how do you decide on these? You have to know what the consequences of this action are going to be. Now, uh, we know today and we can see tomorrow, we can have a lot of observations but these observations do not reveal to us the structure of the world, the how the world works, what causes what. So as, as I uh, showed you in the last lecture, the supply side just think the arrows of causality run in one direction and the demand side just thinks that the arrows of causality run in the other direction. So causality, what causes what, this is, uh, this is what a theory tells you. So inevitably, in order to figure out if I do X, what will happen tomorrow is going to depend on a theory about what causes what. So, for example, the supply side will say that if we increase aggregate demand by pumping money into the economy, this will lead to an expansion of the GDP and a reduction in unemployment. The supply side will say that no, if your government invests in goods, this will drive out an equal amount of private sector goods. So both of these are theories and um, these theories will tell us what to do. And so inevitably we have to theorize. We cannot, as uh, some people thought, we cannot work just by looking at the world and base our decisions on observations because observations are not enough. Now, the theories are often based on faulty understanding. The theories are often wrong. So, we can create change by changing theories. Uh, the power configurations also matter in the sense that some theories are more favorable to the interests of certain powers and so those are more widely adopted even though they are wrong and some theories which are more accurate are discarded because they are not favorable to the interests of power. So what are models and what are theories? Well basically reality is too complex to be captured so we have to simplify. The theories are basically saying that yes you can ignore such and such aspects because it doesn't matter those things are not so important or at least that those things are secondary importance and some things are of primary importance. So the theory identifies what we should be looking at, what we should be focusing on. Um, so the supply side says that the production in the economy is determined by the resources. If you have labor, you have capital, then these will automatically combine in the best possible way to give the uh, output. Uh, the demand side says that, well, what is produced depends on what is demanded, so we have to figure out how much uh, people demand out of the products. So, uh, so the theories are basically ideas about how the world works and the models are uh, then formal representations of the theory, like the Excel spreadsheet that we used last time, it has, I mean, we pick out that these are the key elements, then we build a model which says, okay, this is the, the um, discount rate leads to 
increase in money supply which leads to the investment decision and so on. So these are models. Theories are not true and false. This is very important. A theory, a theory is a simplification. So the question of true false doesn't arise. Question is, have I missed something important in this theory? Or have I taken, is it, it, is, is it satisfactory for a first round broad picture? We cannot accept or reject theory. You can say this theory is completely useless for my purposes, which is equivalent to rejection. Or we can say that for my purposes, even though this is a highly oversimplified, it will give me the rough idea of what I want to do. So for example, if I want to build 5 million houses, I can ask how much will this cost? What will be the... Um, how much cement will be required. So I can make rough calculations even though exact calculations will vary a lot according to specific details. So theories can be assessed for usefulness relative to the purpose for which the theory is designed. So theory is cannot be evaluated independently. This is a, a mistaken conception in the standard uh, presentation that a theory is good or bad, a theory is correct. Theory can be judged to be useful only relative to a goal. For a given goal, one theory may be very useful and for a different goal, the theory may be completely useless. So, economics is a contested dis discipline. There are radically different theories about, as we have just shown, there are two theories which are very much opposed to each other. So how can we make progress? How can we learn the truth? How can we develop better theories? How we can get understanding? Well, in order to understand um, about the truth, you have to know uh, the structures of power and knowledge and how theories which are favored by the powerful tend to dominate even though they are wrong. For example, the theory that economy, economy always achieves full equilibrium was rejected by Keynes and for about 50 years Keynesian theories were dominant and everybody agreed that full employment, creating full employment is the job of the government. Then, the, even though this was a correct theory, it was rejected and the old theory that yes, there is a natural rate of unemployment and the government cannot do anything to change it, this again came to be widely accepted. Why? Well, because the creation of full employment was harmful to the interests of the capitalists because it gave the laborers uh, some power. So if you have a job, then you can resist a lot of exploitation. And um, so um, that's... Uh, so once, uh, if you understand... Um, in an article I've explained that basically at the first level you have facts. At the second level you have theories about these facts and there are multiple theories. And now to understand this issue of which theories are right and which theories are wrong, you have to have a third level which is called the meta-theoretical level. So you have to stand on top of facts and then theories and then judge, okay, here's theory X, here's theory Y, now up, how should I uh, evaluate theory X? So this is called meta-theory and you have to be operating at the meta-theoretical level to understand. Now the way that you are taught economics, you are taught that this is the truth. So there is only one theory and the theory is the truth. And if a theory is not true, then it is wrong. Uh, so, 
since we have the true theory, you must study this and you must learn this and there is nothing else to do. You know, when we understand this, that this is a meta theory that is part of your traditional economics course. The meta theory says that uh, there are two types of theories. Theories are true or false. If a theory is true, then more or less it is just a fact. And in theory, and so the theory, there is no distinction between theories and facts. So just like we observe the world, we observe the true theory. So then there is no issue about, and that's important because once we have the true theory, then we can forecast the future perfectly. And so that's what the neoclassical theory does, that we have, since we already know that the true theory is just a fact, and we know this fact, so we can forecast the future correctly. So, according to the standard meta theory, there is no distinction between observations and theories. Now, at the other end, we have uh, so called uh, postmoderns who say that all the theories are the same, that um, a theory is just my personal way of organizing facts, and you can't say anything about it. So, the um, if I if I think this is theory my theory then this is my theory and nobody else can tell me anything about whether this is good or bad. So the postmoderns eliminate the third level. The the conventional economics eliminates the second level. Just has true and false as the only theory about theories. So we are um, operating with all three levels in place. There are three, some theories are good, some theories are bad. Some theories come into uh, be widely believed because they suit the power interests of the classes. Some theories can be more accurate. Uh, in this context, Thomas Kuhn's book which is called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which was published in the 1960s, was very revolutionary uh, in the sense that it destroyed the standard model of scientific knowledge that everybody had believed up until then. And the standard model of scientific knowledge is that science discovers the laws of nature and there are laws and so science gets the truth and slowly it expands so you have a core set of truths and then you have more truths and you add to these truths so there is a widening circle of knowledge and ultimately you will get to all possible knowledge everything that can be known will be discovered by science so this was the standard model now what Kuhn showed was that this, the study of history shows that science does not proceed like this and that basically science is built on a set of axioms, <coughs> a set of ideas which is called paradigm, which is just uh, taken for granted by everybody. These ideas are not subject to question. Then, so on the top of this paradigm, which are these axioms, you build your theory, but as you build theories, you find that these theories are not in accordance with what you see. Uh, the standard example of this is the Ptolemaic system. According to the Ptolemaic system, the stars travel in uh, perfectly circular orbits around the Earth. So. After tracking the motion of stars for a long time, it was discovered that these orbits are not circular. So then they said, okay, so they introduced a circle on top of the circle that there are actually two circles. And so the stars travels in, in the big circle around the earth and then there is another circle which follows. And by adding this additional circle, they made it possible to fit the stars observations into the orbit. So the theory is evo evolving to match the observations. And then one circle did not suffice to match the discrepancy, so they introduced more circles. And so it was a big complicated mess. 
then um, uh, Muslim astronomers introduced the idea of the elliptical trajectory and the idea that the sun might be the center of the universe. And uh, this was taken up by, copied by Copernicus. And uh, so the whole paradigm shifted in the sense that no, the stars are no longer traveling around the earth. The sun is no longer the center of the universe or the earth. And so all the calculations became different. So what um, that's called a paradigm shift and a revolution. So everything that was true in the old theory is no longer true in the new theory. So now he said that this is not that this is a one-time event, but that science generally progresses like this. There's, there's a paradigm, then there's build up on that paradigm, which is called normal science, and then there's a paradigm shift, and this keeps happening. So if this keeps happening, then the idea that we have a expanding circle of no knowledge no longer makes sense, and um, the idea is that then how do we decide on what is true? This is no longer clear anymore because if we, at one point we are here and then we are here and then we are somewhere else, then what is the truth? So this idea about, this was about physical science, social science is even more in a difficult situation. Uh, the methodology for social science was actually consciously copied from the physical science because the physical sciences uh, had a, a lot of prestige and stature in the West. So the social science, which was developed in basically early 20th century, <coughs> they said that, no, we will copy the methodology of science. So <coughs> this was a big mistake. And... Um, the, because of this, some very crucial features of um, societies became neglected. So one of the features is that uh, science works by universal invariant laws. So the law of gravity is the same here and the same in England and doesn't vary with time. So accordingly, economics was also thought of as a discipline which would have laws which would work in Brazil and also work in India and also work in uh, 19th century and also work in 21st century. So this is the type of laws that you are taught because uh, the idea is that social science should be constructed just like a science. But this idea is false and uh, economic laws are not like physical laws and supply and demand might work differently in um, England and differently in um, India when uh, Gandhi realized that the <coughs> they are exporting cotton from India to England, manufacturing clothing in England and then sending it back to us and selling it at high price and so basically we are paying for the salaries of the workers in Lancaster. He said, no, we should spin our own cloth. Meanwhile, the British had destroyed the local textile industry, which was very advanced, so we didn't have any uh, machines or skills. So uh, he taught people how to... Or uh, There was a local industry which was making khadar, which was a very rough spun cloth, and he said, okay, we will just use this because this is our domestic product. So, obviously, when they make their decision, then the uh, pattern of supply and the pattern of demand all will change. And this depends on how we make our decisions. <coughs> so, the point is that social, uh, that the, the, there is no mechanical laws that we must follow the laws of the economics are determined by what you and I decide. If as a society we decide that from tomorrow every child deserves 
to get an equal education, we can achieve this. It doesn't matter whether the child can pay for the education or not. This is what they did in Finland. That They said that from uh, the education system was in a big mess. They said, okay, we'll just set one goal. All children should receive the same education. It doesn't matter. And uh, they, uh, there are no other goals. We will not... They didn't take any exams, they didn't do anything, they just made sure that everybody gets an equal education and they made tremendous progress. So, I have a lecture on Polanyi's methodology and how it differs from the standard economic methodology I provide you with links. So, what is macroeconomics? The issue is what factors determine the flow of total output produced in the economy over a given period and its growth over time? So this is one of the big questions of macro. What is produced in the economy as a whole and how it grows over time? And <coughs> uh, what factors determine total employment? And why is there large-scale unemployment, like what we see in Pakistan today, and like what occurs from time to time in rich countries as well? And then, what are the? Uh, how do prices evolve? How are prices determined, and how they change? In particular, this is called inflation, but other types of changes can also happen. And then, of course, our domestic economy interacts with the world, we make exports, we make imports, and also the monetary system is interlinked. Uh, so all of these are the questions of macroeconomics. And what are the goals? What, what should we try to do by, with this theory? As I said, a theory cannot be evaluated independently of its purpose, so we have to have a purpose. So one of the goals is to achieve efficiency in production. Although what efficiency means is not always clear. There are some confusions to be cleared up. But basically we should try to make the best possible use of the resources that are available to us. But in particular, we should try to achieve full employment because the most valuable resource is the human being. And also we should aim for price stability prices should not fluctuate randomly and there should not be high inflation. So these are the standard goals and these are agreed upon in between the heterodox and the orthodox school. Both of them uh, agree that the goals of macro should be full employment and price stability. Now what about modern monetary theory? Well, modern monetary theory is characterized by the idea that money plays a central role in the economy. So, uh, whereas the traditional economics uh, ignores the role of money and says that money is a whale, and the real business cycle theory says that money doesn't matter. In fact, uh, in the modern monetary theory, MMT, money is at the center of everything. And basically, um, in 1971, when the, up until, uh, basically the Bretton Woods system set up what is called the uh, gold exchange standard uh, in replacement for the, uh, or maybe it was the dollar standard, dollar exchange standard. So basically the dollar was tied to gold, the um, American government took the responsibility that they would redeem dollar at a standard price uh, in terms of gold. And although nobody ever, or, uh, very few transactions were made where actually dollars were converted to gold, but at least in name, uh, gold was backing the currencies. But in 1971, Nixon said that there is no more backing, the dollar is uh, not going to be redeemed for gold anymore. <clears throat> so, this created a new world with an unbacked currency and uh, it created uh, sovereign money. The value of money 
exists only because I say so. It doesn't have any value because it can be exchanged for gold. So now, uh, in this uh, economy, in this type of economy, a new type of thinking is required, which currently people don't have. People are using the same books and the same thoughts and the same mentality which was true uh, before the gold standard uh, and during the gold standard. And this is one of the key claims that the in, in the economy where money is uh, uh, created by fiat is very different from an economy in which money is tied to gold. When the money is tied to gold, then the government has a budget constraint. It, cannot, it has a certain amount of gold and it cannot print too much money. But when money is created by fiat, then the government does not have a budget constraint. So this issue that how can the government finance um, its expenditures, this is a misleading question. The government can always finance any expenditure it wants to by printing money. So the question to ask is, what will happen if the government decides to finance a huge amount? Suppose that the government decides to print money enough to build the Bhasha Dam. What will happen? The question that government cannot, does not have the money, this is a wrong question. The government has the money, now it chooses not to print. So now the choices have to be analyzed that should we print all the money and do it right away or should we print it in stages and can we uh, and what are the effects? Well, it turns out that the local economy interacts very heavily with the global economy. So, also prior to 1971, there was an attempt to keep the exchange rates fixed. Because if everything is denominated in gold, dollar is worth uh, so much gold and pound is worth so much gold, then the exchange rate is automatically fixed. So, um, gold is also tied to fixed exchange rates. Once there is no gold backing, then the floating exchange rate system is more natural. So, but all of these things have your, their effects on employment and output and on inflation because the economy, domestic economy is linked to the glo global economy. So, as I already said, the government cannot run out of money uh, because it prints it. In the modern monetary theory, the patterns that we want to look at is that the production of output requires income and it also generates income. And um, the income that we earn in the process of production leads to spending, the consumer spending, but also the consumer spending creates the aggregate demand which leads to the production. So there are these interactions that we need to study. The amount of output that is being produced, that governs the levels of employment. If you have high output, you will have high employment. If you have low output, you have low employment. One more very important thing is that <clears throat> in the MMT, we look at the sectoral balances. We look at the government sector and the private sector if the, and, and we um, understand basically that the, each sector is in balance, that is if you imagine the private sector on its own and think of the monetary economy. Suppose we give everybody a certain amount of money and we say, okay, trade among yourselves. Some people produce, some people consume. But in the end, the total amount of money will be the same as it was at the beginning. So, suppose that we have lots of firms and they're trying to make profits and lots of consumers and they're trying to make savings. Not everybody can achieve their goals. This is also an illustration of the um, fallacy of composition that while one firm can legitimately think that if I outcompete my other firms, I will end up making a profit and it can be successful at doing so. 
the firms at a whole cannot succeed in making a profit, all of them, because um, the money can only be redistributed. One has it, the other one doesn't. So what is true for an individual firm is not true at the global level. And this is one of the key <coughs> things that drives the macroeconomics. It's necessary to analyze the macro phenomena <coughs> in a different way then you have to analyze the individual phenomena. This is one of the biggest mistakes of the DSGE model. It reduces the economy to the representative uh, agent. So there is one person and he stands in for the whole economy. Then uh, the whole problem of the fallacy of composition is eliminated. <clears throat> so. Since the private sector will always be in balance, the only way for the private sector to run a surplus is if the government runs a deficit. If the government pumps money in, thereby creating a government deficit, the private sector will run a surplus. If on the other hand, government collects taxes and builds a surplus, then the private sector will run a deficit. Overall balance must be zero. So uh, this is one type of sectoral balances. Also, we can consider the sectoral balance in uh, yani the consum consumer sector and the laborer sector and the producer sector and the capitalist sector separately and that's also so dividing the economy into sectors is useful in understanding what is happening there's also an important issue of stock flow consistency which is required and which is not maintained in your traditional models, in your classical model. Basically, a flow is something which occurs in units per period of time and a stock is a fixed amount of something. So it is measured at a single point in time. A flow is something which is going on through time. So this most important example is the savings and investment. So savings is uh, flow, you do some savings per amount of time and these savings are accumulated into the wealth. And so in your traditional Keynesian model, the consumers are doing savings and the savings go into this aggregate wealth. And that is very important because uh, the consumers look at their wealth in terms of deciding uh, how much to consume. So if you are able to make positive savings, that adds to your wealth. If you dissave, if you have income that is too low, then you might reduce your wealth. So wealth is the stock and savings is the flow. Similarly, the relationship between investment and capital. Investment is the flow across time. People are continuously investing and uh, the stock is the, uh, the total amount of capital which is in existence. So as we keep investing, the total stock of capital increases, but also depreciation is taking place, so some of the capital is going obsolete, so that leads to reductions. So you have to make sure that your stocks and flows are consistent, so if, you are, if the consumers are uh, continuously saving, then your wealth stock is going up. You cannot have a situation where wealth stock is going down, but savings are taking place, and that's called stock flow consistency. One very important thing is that the trade flows must net to zero once you start looking at the world in intersectoral way. So people talk about export-led growth. Well, we can do exports only if somebody is willing. We can have a surplus in terms of exports only if somebody else has a deficit. So if we have a trade uh, a surplus, then somebody has a trade deficit. So unless, so the only way to uh, create an export-led growth strategy is somebody is following an import-led growth strategy. So there is no, uh, this is any, uh, we can have deficit only when someone wants to hold a surplus. Uh, similarly, all positions, whether it's deficit or sur surplus, they are sustainable. It's nothing that the economy will collapse if this happens. All, all of the outcomes, whether it's huge deficit or huge surplus, America has run huge surpluses, trillion dollars for long amount of time without any 
visible impact on the economy. So the thing that we need to worry about that is uh, part of MMT is called functional finance. We want to achieve some goals, economic goals. So how much deficit we should run in order to achieve the goal. And uh, one of the uh, recommendations of MMT is that we shouldn't talk about balancing the budget because the government does not have a budget. We should talk about fiscal surplus, fiscal balance which means expenditure and um, revenue are balanced or fiscal deficit which means that the government spends more money into the uh, private sector than it taxes away from them. So a fiscal surplus, a fiscal deficit is exactly the same as a private sector surplus. And one very important thing is that the household finance is not a valid analogy. People think that the government is just one big house and so it has to keep the balanced budget but this is just a fallacy of composition. What holds at the general level does not hold at the individual level. Because of failure to take into account all of these factors that we have discussed of MMT, uh, conventional economics does not understand the effects of the surplus and deficit and this is also not understood in the public sector. So every day you are receiving WhatsApp messages about how the government deficit is horrible and, and we must have this problem. So everybody is a macroeconomist these days. <clears throat> so if the government tries to run a surplus, this will lead to a private deficit which can only be financed by debt and basically that can happen. The private sector will have to go into debt in order to uh, pay their taxes to the government. So since the government does not need to raise revenue, it can always print, so the government can just abandon taxation, it doesn't need to do any taxation. But taxation serves some other purposes. One of the purposes is redistribution of the wealth. Another purpose is to absorb excess aggregate demand which might lead to inflation. Generally speaking, um, the lessons of MMT are that running a surplus or running a balanced budget is not generally desirable. And um, the, in order to understand what is going on, you need to have the complex system which is different from the um, basically the fallacy of composition and there are multiple agents and multiple sectors. So fiscal policy has to do with how much the government spends and how much the government earns. Fiscal space is what is the amount that the government can spend safely in order to achieve desirable outcomes. If the government goes out and spends widely, it will disrupt the economic system obviously because basically as the, if the government buys up all the resources, the resources will not be left for others to have and so that will lead to various kinds of undesirable outcomes but the government can do it, that's very important. So basically, uh, in order to have, in order to prevent being tied down, in order to be able to spend comfortably on what needs to be done, the government should avoid incurring foreign debts or guaranteeing debt. The government never needs to uh, take foreign debt because whatever it needs to buy, it should be paid for out of Ultimately, it will be paid for out of our own uh, production. So, the deal should already be structured in such a way that what you are getting, you pay back in terms of uh, real output. Uh, one of the things is project financing. For example, if you build a dam, then you should uh, pay back from the proceeds, from the earnings of the electricity generated by that dam. So um, it should always be denominated in the currency that 
that you have control over. This will allow you, if you follow these rules, then you can spend as much money as you like. Uh, you should keep your currency free. You should not tie it by fixing the exchange rate or use dollarization as is done in some other economies where dollar becomes part of your local economy. It's used in local exchange. So, for example, very recently there was this issue that arose in the CPEC agreements that should we allow the use of yuans in Gua that the Chinese wanted this. So, uh, how, nobody actually had any clear idea about whether or not this should be allowed, but they said, okay, this is against uh, the sovereignty of Pakistan, so we should have rupees. But actually, these questions are not uh, addressable in the conventional macroeconomics. But we can discuss this and understand the effects, what would happen if we allow free use of yuan and uh, rupees simultaneously in Gwadar. So uh, our macro models allow us to analyze real questions that we face today, which conventional macro theorists cannot handle and for which uh, the finance ministry doesn't have the training. Now, if the government follows these rules, it uh, doesn't uh, get its hand tied by um, in terms of foreign currencies, which is what has happened now, which is, so once you see you, are, you have your obligations in foreign currencies, then you have to go to the IMF. Once you go to the IMF, then the IMF says that this is how much you must tax, this is how much you can spend. So basically then you have no fiscal space left. Fiscal space means that I can spend as I want, I can have my deficit as large as I want. Nobody else tells me how much deficit I should run. But when you have to borrow dollars from the IMF to pay back loans, then the IMF tells you that this is the amount of deficit that you can have. And so your fiscal space disappears. In that case, then the government can purchase anything that is available for sale. Uh, if something is unutilized, then the government can purchase it. In particular, it can employ all the labor. So this leads to a very important policy recommendation that the government should be the employer of the last resort. That if somebody can't find a job, then the government should give him a job. This is also called a job guarantee program. All who can do productive work are guaranteed jobs. Also, <clears throat> because the creation of money is so central to government policy, you cannot have a central bank and treasury be independent of the government uh, because then the policies cannot be coordinated. And so this uh, famous uh, idea which is being pushed all over the world is that the central bank should be independent. This is not correct according to MMT. The policy implications of MMT are that unemployment results from taxation which causes uh, businesses to contract and it uh, um, results from governments having running insufficient deficit because when the government does not run sufficient deficit, then the private sector surplus is too little and it cannot employ all the people that, that uh, need jobs. So basically there are two approaches to controlling uh, inflation. The standard approach which we are currently following in Pakistan is that uh, prevent, yani, do not, uh, yani, uh, you see if you allow a lot of surplus, then there will be a lot of money in the economy. And if there's a lot of money in the economy and the resources are constrained, then this will lead to inflation. So the um, Keynes said about this that the solution to the business cycle is not to uh, get rid of booms and uh, keep the economy in a permanent bust, but rather to get rid of busts and keep the economy in a permanent boom. According to the traditional uh, economic theory, only way to control inflation is to create unemployment. So basically we kill the economy by uh, reducing the surplus available to the private sector. This 
leads to a recession where the jobs go away and the incomes go down and the aggregate demand goes down and then the inflation comes under control. But there is a huge cost inflicted by uh, having large unemployment and having wasted resources. So once you reconceptualize the labor market, this is not running on supply and demand, then basically as we saw there is a large buffer stock of people who are having jobs in a relatively low paid informal, uh, informal sector and they have jobs but when the formal sector expands then they can get jobs in the formal sector. So exactly like that if the government acts as an employer of the last resort then we have a job guarantee programs and no, anybody who can't find a job will get a job with the government but the goal is not for the government to give jobs to everybody but this is to create a buffer stock to handle the expansions, the booms and the bust of the business cycle. If the business cycle is running badly then the government gives jobs to all those who can't find it and so they are supported with their minimal basic needs. But as the economy picks up, then everybody gets better jobs in the private sector and they go and get those jobs. So, at a higher level we have to understand that what are the goals of economic policy? I mean, uh, the public purpose, the macroeconomics is basically dealing with the smaller issues of achieving full employment, keeping prices stable, but there is a bigger purpose of society as a whole, which is not really the job of macroeconomics as such, it is the job of economic policy. So what are the goals of public policy? Well, according to the neoclassical, the public, the government should do nothing, the invisible hand will do everything by magic. But uh, if we... Um, uh, come to a more sensible position then the goal of public policy should be to make sure that everybody has food, clothing, shelter, education, health care and there is a legal framework so everybody can get justice and uh, people, the children who are born receive uh, socialization required to enable them to function in the society. In an Islamic society, the primary purpose of the society is Amr bil Maruf and Nahyan al Munkir and the provision of justice. But justice includes economic justice, social justice, political justice. So, all of these things that are discussed earlier fall into this framework. So, uh, the chapter of the book discusses how we should determine our public goals. And one of the criteria is, of course, that we should have consensus on these goals and that these goals can shift with time. So one of the goals that are discussed in the book are the UN Declaration of Universal Human Rights, which lists a large number of goals. And the point of that is that this was a set of goals on which large-scale consensus emerged. So we can uh, expect that in a uh, democratic society, most people would vote for that and that means that we can get public policy aligned with that goals. More recently there was the Millennial Development Goals which have been replaced by the Sustainable Development Goals. All of these are things on which large-scale consensus exists. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there is the field of multidimensional poverty in which it is uh, assessed that people need, are deprived on different dimensions and so we want to eliminate these deprivations. All of these are things about which a lot of thought has gone on. This is different from the conventional economic theory which says that there is only money. See, if you have poverty, if you give the person money, then he will automatically take care of all of his deprivations in the best possible manner because he maximizes. So it's never the case in conventional theory that I should provide education, I should provide food, I should just take the money and give it, because that will not maximize your utility, I should just take the money and give it to the individual and he can choose how much food to get, how much education to get because he will automatically make the best choices for him. But this turns out to be empirically wrong 
when you give uh, the poor money, then they spend it in ways which are not the best for them. Uh, for welfare, for example, they might spend, they might uh, sell their only cow for uh, to finance the wedding and then be reduced to uh, extreme poverty, unable to eat, things like that. Decisions happen. So, we need to move beyond the conception of markets in order to conduct policy. The book gives the example that in a certain that there was a global campaign to eliminate smallpox. This was something that private sector cannot do. Not only that, it's not consistent with profit maximization because if you um, eliminate, eradicate smallpox, then you won't be able to sell any more smallpox medicine. So it's better that a certain amount remains. All right, so that's uh, the end of this chapter. I will uh, put up some uh, <coughs> links.